Thank you very much, David. Our next speaker is Professor Peter Salson from Syracuse University in New York. Professor Salson is an expert in the search for gravitational waves and has been involved in this effort for over 30 years. His title today is Exploring the Frontier of Astrophysical Relativity with Advanced LIGO. Okay, Th thank you, Gary, and I'd like to thank the organizers. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here uh, and uh, mark the 100th anniversary of, of general relativity. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the uh, attempt, which will very soon succeed, to uh, verify one of the most profound uh, predictions of general relativity. Uh, it was mentioned by, by Professor Gross uh, in, in his beautiful talk, and that is the idea that gravitational influences can't propagate at infinite speed, as, as Newton's gravity would have said, but instead must propagate no faster than the speed of light, the idea of gravitational waves. Now, for someone like myself, um, who's been uh, devoting decades to helping make this uh, uh, experimental confirmation come to pass, I think of this not as the 100th anniversary of general relativity, but the 99th anniversary of Einstein's prediction of gravitational waves, uh, derivation of it from uh, uh, the, the, the uh, field equations of general relativity. So we've got one more year to make it to the uh, 100th anniversary of, of the prediction that in, Li in LIGO we, we most care about. Uh, whether we'll make it or not, uh, we'll, we'll see soon enough. So um, I'm going to tell you about gravitational waves in more detail than you've heard before, what they are, where they come from, what we'll learn about uh, the universe from detecting them. And then I'm going to uh, take us to a rather sober spot of explaining the challenge of detecting them, why it is that 99 years after their prediction, we still have not succeeded. Um, uh, but then I'd like to raise the mood again uh, by uh, explaining how indeed we are about to meet the challenge, both with advanced LIGO project that I've been working on and many sister projects and actually several other experimental efforts that all by an interesting historical chance are coming to fruition around the same time. I'll also explain what sort of things in the universe uh, we will be able to see once we are able to detect gravitational waves. That's a, a rich subject I'll only be able to, to touch on, but I do want to mention a special role for this country, uh, there's a proposal sitting on the Prime Minister's desk right now to put a gravitational wave detector in India. It's of prime importance for our field, and I will highlight that a bit. Uh, and I'll close with a, a few remarks about what we should expect in, in the next few years. Um, let, let me take us back a, a bit. It's hard to, to think that, that anything I could say uh, to set this in context could, uh, would need to be said after Professor Gross's wonderful talk. But there's one point I'd like to, to, to emphasize uh, in our own way. Um, physics was born in the study of orbits, the orbit of the moon around the Earth, the orbit of the planets around the sun. And of course, it was the greatest triumph of Newton's law of gravitation and, and Newton's laws of motion that it could be understood. Um, but it turned out that orbits are more subtle than Newton understood. Um, and in fact, uh, it was only with Einstein's general relativity that we were able to see that uh, there are situations where orbits will decay, and in fact, may decay rather dramatically through the radiation of energy, the loss of energy by a binary system uh, through the emission of gravitational waves. What I'd like to show you is uh, a, a video made of a numerical simulation of the orbit of two black holes around one another. So here you can see one black hole and another. 
uh, some characteristics of space-time curvature that have been calculated in this numerical simulation are shown in the yellow. We're about to see some red, and as the two stars are spiraling together faster and faster, you see those red marks indicating uh, a, a novel feature of space-time curvature radiating away. And at the end of this process, what, what, what was originally a pair of black holes in orbit around one another became a single larger black hole. This is a phenomenon that we hope very soon to be observing uh, by detecting the gravitational waves emitted by that process, uh, as was shown in, in, in those red marks. And when we do it, we will be able to not only verify this remarkably novel relativistic phenomenon of decaying orbits, we'll be able to verify in a way we have not yet been able to do uh, that in fact, Einstein's insight was correct that gravity too must obey the principle that no uh, signal uh, travels faster than the speed of light. So we do in fact hope to find black hole binaries and actually listen to them with our own ears. If we build gravitational wave telescopes, uh, which you can think of with only a slight stretch of the imagination as audio telescopes to sense the vibrations of space-time. Not only will we find black hole binaries, we're expecting to find binaries consisting of objects that are almost as interesting as black holes, binaries of uh, neutron stars and perhaps mixed ones. We'll look for uh, signals from the core collapse that uh, ignites a supernova and, and many other phenomena. Now, we actually already know with very good experimental evidence that something very much like that process I showed you an animation of exists. Uh, since 1974, we've been following the motion of a pulsar discovered in that year by Russell Hulse and Joe Taylor, pulsar 1913 plus 16, uh, which within a night of its discovery was realized to be uh, a neutron star in orbit around another neutron star. So almost what we saw the animation of, except neutron stars together in, uh, instead of black holes. Now these two neutron stars are farther apart than the two black holes that I showed you the animation of. They go around each other once every eight hours. But because that, that pulsar that's observed is a tremendously good clock, it's possible to measure with remarkable precision precisely where in their orbits around each other those two stars are. And in the intervening years between 1974 and today, we've seen a phenomenon uh, marked on this graph. This is time from 1975 to 2005. And the red dots show that the orbit has gotten ahead of itself, by which I mean if you make, take the very precise measurement of the orbital period at the, at the epoch of discovery and ask, OK, where should those two stars be in their orbit over uh, the, the 30 years marked by this data, the stars have gotten ahead of themselves in their orbit by 40 seconds. The red points are the data. The black curve going right through the experimental points shows what Einstein's theory predicted for the beginnings of the decay of the orbit, the beginnings of that process that I showed you an animation of. So we do, in fact, know that gravitational waves exist. But as I'll try to convince you in the next few minutes, we can learn so much more if we actually interact with the waves themselves. We're not actually detecting the gravitational waves from the binary pulsar with instruments here. We're only seeing their effect on, I shouldn't say only. It's tremendous that we're seeing the effect um, of the emission of gravitational wave on those two stars. But it will be even cooler when we interact with the gravitational waves themselves. So let me now begin to sketch how we might go about uh, sensing 
the vibrations of space-time that, that are gravitational waves. So I would like, in good Einsteinian tradition, to sketch first a thought experiment, and then my job over uh, the next minutes is to gradually build this up into a description of a real experiment. So here I have a situation where red dots are symbolizing uh, a thought experiment where each red dot should be thought of as some object with some mass. doesn't matter at all what it is because of the principle of equivalence. But each of those objects should be freely falling, able to respond uh, to gravitational effects with, without any complications. And now I want you to imagine that a gravitational wave is propagating from the auditorium into the plane of the screen in which those freely falling test masses are sitting. And my animation is not going to work, so I will use my hands. What the gravitational wave's effect is going to do is take this original orientation of masses and at one moment move this one towards the center while that one moves away. At the next moment, this moves away, that moves down. If you look at these two, they move together and apart, and in antiphase, apart and together. So if we have freely falling masses and we're able to measure their separations, ideally in two perpendicular directions at the same time, we should be able to sense that a gravitational wave has passed through our apparatus. Here's another diagram which wasn't intended to move, but was intended to uh, show the pattern in some more detail. This time, instead of all those um, red dots, I've made some uh, black squares in a regular square grid. And um, I want, I'm asking you to imagine two moments. The black squares are in position that they might be as a gravitational wave was passing through them. The white squares were where I set them up. And you can see at this particular moment, all of the positions, all of the relative positions in the x direction are stretched. And all of the relative positions in the y direction are compressed. Wait for the wave to reverse sign half a cycle later, and the pattern will be reversed. The black ones stretched vertically and compressed horizontally. Now, I, I wanted to draw it this way to introduce a few ideas. First of all, um, to have you recognize first and foremost that this is an effect that's a proportional effect on that whole grid. If you look at the change in separation between those two masses, it's a small effect. The separation between these two, it's a large effect. We call this a strain. It's a quadrupolar strain because of this alternating x and y pattern. Um, and uh, because it's a proportional effect, we can describe its amplitude as a dimensionless number, which we traditionally refer to as h. I do hope we have a plug for this, um, since that was a low battery remark. Um, now, so. The amplitude is a dimensionless number uh, by convention that I don't want to uh, explain right now. We refer to that amplitude as twice the fractional separation change. Um, is this a chord that should be plugged in? Oh, no, it's that. Okay. So uh, a stronger gravitational wave is marked by a bigger distortion in, in legs. And, and in particular, the other idea is the thing that I just emphasized a moment ago, that is, if we're going to build an apparatus, and this is a step through thought experiments to, um, uh, to, toward a real one, we'll be better off if we place our freely falling test masses whose separation we're going to measure uh, as far apart as we can. That's just built into the structure of how these things go. Now, 
I asked you to imagine a gravitational wave passing through the screen, but I didn't describe in any detail what should be the pattern of alternating uh, stretchings and squeezings. That depends on the dynamics of the source of gravitational waves. Now, if you recall the animation, um, the two black holes, when they're far apart, we understand this from Newton's laws as well as anything else, have a low orbital period, and then as they lose energy and spiral together, they move faster and faster and faster. And in fact, um, that is a generic pattern that we uh, will expect to see from any gravitational waves that come from an in-spiraling binary, and it's a process uh, because we can calculate orbits with great precision, we can also calculate what the uh, pattern of alternating uh, stretchings and squeezings of a test mass pattern should be. And this is an example of a calculation from one particular uh, model of a black hole binary. And you see some quasi-sinusoidal motion, but it's speeding up until the two stars uh, coalesce together. And then finally, there is a radiation away of the, the residual distortions of the newly formed big black hole. We're able to predict this um, with, uh, with great detail and uh, we'll be able to measure it with instruments that, that I'm describing. Now, um, we can actually predict this from many hours, many seconds, up to the last moments of uh, the coalescence of two stars in a binary. And now here is a remarkable thing. Not only can we calculate this, and not only am I, am I hoping to convince you that we're about to detect it, the signals from objects with masses like the sun give signals in the audio band that if only we can detect them and then turn the volume really up as far as we can go on the speakers, we could hear it. And in fact, I will, I will tell you what you would hear if two neutron stars uh, coalesce together. <laughs> Just like that. We can actually calculate it and, and play it. And that sound is the sound we expect from two neutron stars of 1.4 solar masses each. If they were black holes of 10 solar masses, we'd hear <laughs> instead. Encoded in the sound are, in fact, the details of this waveform, which we could also plot out if, if we preferred. And encoded in them are the dynamics of the source. Here it is in a little more mathematical detail. The amplitude of that distortion of our set of test masses is up to some constants, just given by the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of that mass distribution uh, that, the, that the binary is made up of. It's a wave, so its amplitude falls off with the distance from the source. And then there's this pesky set of constants we've seen before, 2g over c to the fourth. I know it's impolite to talk about the sizes of dimensionful numbers, but to me, an experimenter, G is a small number, C is a big number, and we've got it to the fourth power in the denominator. And there's a correct way of saying this makes our life miserable as experimenters. <laughs> um, but the good thing is, once we meet our challenges, what we will be able to do not only is say, oh, I've seen a gravitational wave, but by having measured the gravitational waveform, we will in fact be mapping out the history of the mass distribution of the source that made it. So when signals are detected at a high enough signal-to-noise ratio, um, we will uh, be able to interpret those signals with a, with a great deal of, of confidence. Um, so to, to summarize this motivational part of, of my talk, uh, let me say that looking for gravitational waves is important for many reasons. One is gravitational waves embody gravity's obedience to that key special relativistic insight of Einstein's that no signal can travel faster than light. Um, 
they will allow us, as I just indicated, a view into the relativistic dynamics of orbits that in spiral, two black holes colliding. In the details of those final moments of two black holes coming together, we will be able to understand the process of gravitational collapse with new observations that we've never been able to make, test this uh, fundamental idea of general relativity and the idea of black holes called the no hair theorem. Perhaps in particular, see the precisely predicted dynamics of vibrating away those distortions in the so-called quasi-normal modes of the ring down after, after the, the coalescence. Um, and while we're at it, we'll be able to do a lot of other cool science. Um, as, as I'll show you in a moment, we will be able to show um, with a, a kind of observation that, that, that I'll sketch that gravitational waves travel precisely at sea or set very strong limits on how far uh, those speeds uh, of gravity waves and light might be different and uh, make tests of whether the graviton is massless and has spin two. We will be able to look for phenomena associated with cosmic strings. We will check the mechanism of gamma ray bursts that Professor Gross mentioned a few moments ago. We will uh, make measurements that uh, ought to let us learn the equation of state of the matter that makes up neutron stars. We will learn new things about the cosmic abundances of heavy elements, which we now believe to be formed, many of them in the collisions of two neutron stars after a coalescence and with luck, eventually, even explore the universe at Planckian timescales. That one's perhaps a bit far in the future. Um, here's a simple sketch of how we might check that gravity waves uh, travel at the speed of light. Um, short gamma ray bursts, unlike the gamma ray bursts that Professor Gross mentioned, uh, uh, he was talking about the ones made in supernovae. Those are called long gravitational wave, uh, long gamma ray bursts, but short gamma ray bursts are believed to come from precisely this coalescence process, either of two neutron stars or neutron stars and black holes. That means that some of the time we will simultaneously be able to detect a gravity wave signal and a gamma ray signal the time scale of those short gamma ray bursts is of order a second, if we, are, we succeed at that and see that within of order a second, those signals do arrive in coincidence. And if, as we expect, the signals will be coming from a typical distance once advanced LIGO is working, a typical distance of about 200 megaparsecs, plug the numbers in and you see that seeing coincident signals tells you right off the bat that to better than a part in 16, the speed of gravity waves is, is the speed of light. Uh, if I had more time, I could sketch lots more cool physics uh, that we could do. But what I'd like to move to now is to discuss the challenges that we have to meet and how we're meeting them and why we think that in the next few years we will succeed. So if I actually want to implement that thought experiment as a real experiment, I need a set of free or approximately free test masses and I need them as far apart as is practicable to make them. I need a means to measure their relative motion. Can't just look from the top of a screen. I actually have to do it with real masses. And because of that terrible 2G over C to the fourth, I need to isolate the masses with exquisite precision from other causes of motion of those masses. And because of that prefactor, based on what we know about uh, astrophysics, we think that unlike that few percent strain pattern that I showed you on the diagram, instead of a few parts in 10 to the 2, we're looking for a part or a few parts of 10 to the 22 as the strain amplitude. And that should scare anyone. Um, if that doesn't scare you, I will give you another dimension full number. If I place my mirrors four kilometers apart, they will change their separation by no more than about 10 to the minus 19 meters, which is smaller than the diameter of a proton by a number of orders of magnitude. So we should have pause. 
but hold your fears. I will try to resolve them. So let's invent a gravity wave detector building from that thought experiment. Instead of all of those squares in the grid, let me just pick out three. Something at a corner and something in the x direction and something in the y direction. That's enough to reveal that directions uh, in x are momentarily stretched while simultaneously uh, distances in the y direction are, are momentarily compressed. As I said, in, in LIGO, we have made that separation four kilometers. Now, so that's the beginning of a thought experiment, but let's think about how we might measure the relative separations and how they would change as a gravity wave uh, comes by. Um, here is a, a sketch at the thought experiment level of the kind of interferometer that Albert Michelson invented in the late 19th century to search for uh, uh, light's constancy of speed through the uh, postulated ether. It consists of a mirror here, a mirror here arranged uh, in an L shape with at the corner a beam splitting mirror that lets through 50% of the light and reflects 50% of the light. Have some bright light source here that shines light in. That light comes to the beam splitter moves through both arms, is reflected, comes back to the beam splitter, and that superposed light is allowed to, at least the portion of it that's reflected, is allowed to fall on a photodetector. Let's think about how that's a relative distance measuring device. Here I've sketched a few cycles of the ultra-high frequency light os uh, oscillations in the X arm and the Y arm. If those arms are perfectly matched in length, as the light goes down, X arm and Y arm returns to the beam splitter, the two light waves which left the beam splitter in phase will return precisely in phase. They will superpose constructively and make a bright uh, beam at the beam splitter. If the distances have shifted by enough so that um, one light wave has had to take just enough time uh, more than the other, so that they come back perfectly out of phase, then we'll see no light on the photodetector. Or at intermediate values of the arm length difference, we'll see intermediate amounts of light falling on the photodetector. And that's how we can measure the relative separations of mirrors, even if they are four kilo kilometers or more apart. Here's a sketch of, of actually how Michelson did it. This is from his 1887 paper. It's a beam splitter, a bunch of mirrors. It actually looks a little more complicated than the L shape because when Michelson first made the L shape, he didn't have enough signal to test the ether drift. So he actually folded the light path back and forth multiple times with these extra mirrors that he put at the various corners. Note something else besides the layout, Michelson lovingly draws in great detail how he rigidly mounted the mirrors to the table with adjustment screws so that those mirrors would not move once they were lined up and only the putative ether effect could be seen. Here are some pictures of how we do it in LIGO. We have to have aerial photographs because four kilometers, uh, that's, the, that's the only way to see it. Here are our two LIGO observatories, this one in eastern Washington state at the Hanford site, and this one in Livingston Parish in the state of Louisiana in the American South. The instruments look almost identical from this view, except for the terrain. We wanted them far apart for reasons that, um, uh, I, that I will explain in a little bit. Uh, this was put together during the late 90s and early 2000s, and uh, it reached an initial sensitivity goal in 2005. Uh, and we uh, observed off and on in the next five years um, at this pretty impressive sensitivity level of 10 to the minus 21 strain, not quite 10 to the 22. We aren't the only people doing this. We have some very important colleagues uh, we collaborate intensively with 
the GEO project. Here's an aerial photograph of the 600 meter GEO interferometer near Hanover. That's a joint project of Germany and the UK. And we also have a close and getting ever closer collaboration with the Virgo project. Uh, there is the three kilometer Virgo interferometer outside of Pisa. Uh, and during that uh, period of time, uh, we all made those observations together. Now, I want to disabuse you of the fact of the thought, if it had occurred to you, that we'll be able to achieve one part in 10 to the 22 sensitivity by just building a slightly bigger copy of Michelson's interferometer. Here is still a highly simplified sketch of our modifications to the Michelson interferometer. We have a very elaborate uh, beam folding scheme called a fabry perot cavity in each of our two arms that traps the light for many round trips. We have a much more powerful laser than, uh, well, Michelson didn't have a laser at all, but we have 180 watts eventually of, 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 of light power that is very elaborately filtered, um, and uh, the interferometer is modified in ways I will sketch in a bit uh, to improve the sensitivity even more. But now, let me make what's perhaps my second most scary point, and to an experimenter, this is every bit as scary. Michelson bolted his mirrors down to the table. It's crucial that those mirrors, if an interferometer is supposed to work, are very precisely aligned and sit at very precisely in a length relationship to one another. We're not allowed to bolt our mirrors down. They need to be as free as we can make them. We hang them from uh, pendulums to allow them to swing freely, not at the resonant frequency or frequencies below, but at frequencies above the resonant frequency of the pendulum. Uh, uh, they are effectively free. But that requirement removes from us one of Michelson's key techniques. How do you keep uh, the interferometer actually working? How do you keep the light beams going in the right place? How do you keep the mirrors from swinging? So on top of a tremendous mechanics experiment and a tremendous optics experiment, we have a tremendous controls engineering experiment to somehow arrange to apply very gentle influences to the mirrors to hold them in the right place and the right alignment while allowing them to be effectively free to the influence of, of gravitational waves. And I put these diagrams of our control system up not to explain them to you in the few moments we have together, but simply to scare you or to um, impress you with the hard work that, that we're doing. Now, uh, can we measure a part in 10 to the 22 strain? We can. Partly we do it by making the arms long to make a big relative motion. Partly we do it with those fabry pro cavities, the more sophisticated uh, version of Michelson's multiple bounces with multiple mirrors. Uh, partly we do it uh, by using a tremendous amount of light power. And I'll explain why the amount of light power is important. As I was explaining, what we've got in effect is something that transduces relative arm length changes in that interferometer into an observable brightness. So by measuring brightness, we infer that arm length changed one way or another. But we can only therefore uh, measure the arm length difference change to the extent that we can very precisely measure the brightness. If we want to uh, make the kinds of sensitivities that, that I'm describing, we need to measure the brightness not to a few percent, but to a part in 10 to the 10 or so. And you need a tremendous number of photons arriving every second to make a part in 10 to the 10 measurement possible. And that's why we need the powerful lasers and some other tricks. So in advanced LIGO, which is going to turn on uh, this fall, we will have eventually 125 watts. We've got right now about 25 or 30 watts available. Um, we need those arm folding cavities uh, with the, with the uh, 
folding factor of about 450. We need another trick that we call power recycling, where we take the light that doesn't go to the photodetector, which is most of it by an arrangement that we make, and send it back in phase synchronous with new fresh laser light so that it, we reuse the light many times. We've got a recycling factor of about 500. So beyond 125 watts, multiply that up by another factor of 500 to get some more photons. And we've got another trick that it would take me 20 or 30 minutes, which I won't take to explain, that actually catches the signal as it's on its way out to the photodetector and resonantly builds it up as well that we call signal recycling. So those are the tricks that uh, we have in mind. Now let me show you some hardware. Here is what a four kilometer, one meter diameter vacuum tube connecting the beam splitter to uh, a distant test mass looks like when it's being constructed. Um, big stainless steel pipes assembled in the field with no leaks. Here are places where we can put a beam splitter and the input masses of those Fabry-Perot folding cavities. For reference, I stand about that tall. These are evacuated to uh, 10 to the minus 7 tor or thereabouts. Here's an example a diagram and a photograph of how we suspend our mirrors freely as pendulums. Here is a test mass. Uh, at one end, suspended by a few silica fibers from another mass, which is in turn suspended, that gives us both the uh, free response of our mirrors and is part of a very elaborate filtering system to keep vibrations of the ground around our instrument from becoming vibrations of the mirrors. For reference, the ground shakes by about a micrometer. And we're looking for 10 to the minus 19 meters. Okay. Enough said. Here's some more of our vibration isolation system, a nested set of multi-degree of freedom servo controlled uh, isolators. That's a wonderful control engineering project in its own right. So that's an illustration of what it takes to go beyond the Michelson interferometer to redo his experiment as a gravity wave detector that should reach sensitivities of 10 to the minus 22. Um, let me describe sensitivity with, with some other figures of merit. Um, the source of signals whose, whose rate we understand most precisely will be neutron star binaries. I wish it were black hole binaries. We'll probably get them along the way, but we know if only we can see neutron star binaries to a distance of 200 megaparsecs, that will do the trick for us. There will be enough uh, coalescences within that volume to allow us to see multiple events per year. When we ran between 2005 and 2010, we could see neutron star binaries to 20 megaparsecs. Pretty good, but not good enough based on our understanding of abundances. That got us out to the Virgo cluster, but there's not enough neutron star binaries per year in the Virgo cluster. That's why advanced LIGO was designed with the requisite features to see to a distance of see neutron star binaries to a distance of 200 uh, megaparsecs. So here, in case that idea needs any illustration, here is that uh, uh, 3D map of the sky with initial LIGOs. Uh, sensitivity sphere drawn here and now I've redrawn everything but zoomed out so initial LIGO's survey volume was only here go out another factor of 10 the volume of that sphere includes a thousand times more uh, signals and that's what's going to make the difference once we reach our design sensitivity now we're not there yet uh, but we're getting there Advanced LIGO is already assembled and is being tuned up. And already at this stage, we have gone uh, three times farther in our sensitive distance than initial LIGO could. So by some measure, about half the way to our factor of, of 10. This is a graph that shows the spectrum of our noise. 
as a function of frequency from 10 hertz, 100 hertz, a kilohertz on up uh, at uh, our two LIGO detectors. The gold curve shows the Hanford detector, uh, while the purple curve shows the Livingston, Louisiana detector. And you can see that at frequencies um, at 100 hertz and above, we're already reaching uh, all the sensitivity that we could get with the 15 watts of laser power that was being shown in when these measures are made. We've still got some tuning to do at lower frequencies, um, uh, but, but we're, we're making good progress. We also need to do some more work to bring the rest of that uh, 180 watts of laser power away uh, uh, in, into play. But nevertheless, with what we've implemented so far, we're now observing to a distance of about, capable of observing to a distance of about 60 megaparsecs. Starting this September, we're going to have a trial observing run. We'd have to be a bit lucky to see signals, but you never know, we're starting to get close. Here is a sketch of a planned development over the next few years that should bring us to where we need to be. Here is now a theoretical set of sensitivity spectra, 10 hertz, 100 hertz, a kilohertz. Note that our good sensitivity is in the audio band where I whistled. The blue band shows our guess made several years ago about where we would be in 2015. And we're smack dab in the middle of, of this range. So we are ready for our first three-month observing run this fall. Uh, and we'll do it. Over the next couple of years, in either 2016 or 2017, we should pick up to around 100 megaparsecs and then pick up the last factor of two by maybe it's 2018, 2019, depending on uh, how our luck goes. And somewhere, could be this fall, more likely when we're in the green or the red range, we do in fact expect to start seeing signals. We really expect those neutron star binaries and there's every reason to expect that around the same sensitivity, we'll see binaries involving black holes as well. And then we will be able to start working our way through that checklist of pretty cool uh, physics and astronomy to do. Now, to do astronomy, it's really important that we not only detect signals and measure their waveforms, but learn where they come from. Here's a bit of a drawback. In this way too, and gravity wave interferometer is like an ear in that with a single ear you can't tell where a sound came from. The sensitivity is nearly omnidirectional. But if you start building up stereo or better quad detection, then by the time delays between uh, this interferometer sees a signal a few milliseconds before that one, we can find where on the sky signals came from. So Advanced Virgo is just a little bit behind in its development plan, but will be joining us within a year or so. And uh, equally, if not more important, is the possibility of putting a third LIGO detector, not in the United States, but somewhere in India. Let me show you why that's so important. Here is a set of maps marked as if they're on the globe, but think of them as sky maps. And the blue ellipses show to scale on this globe of the sky the size of the error regions for detected binary neutron star systems in the early days, if we're lucky enough to see them at 80 megaparsecs. This is with Hanford, Livingston, and, and Virgo. Here, that same network, Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo, uh, finding signals in 2019 at 160 megaparsecs. I would love to have this problem, but notice while some of these error circles from signals that come from favorable directions are relatively small, some of them are terrible. You show this to an astronomer and they say, how am I going to find the one thing that is the counterpart of that signal if you give me an error box that's that big? Adding India to the network suddenly shrinks all parts of the sky into very good air box sizes. And that's why we dearly hope that the Prime Minister uh, soon approves the LIGO India project. Now, let me just close 
by pointing out that terrestrial interfer interferometric detectors that I've been sketching are hardly the only ways to do this. They are well suited, as I pointed out, to audio band signals. But the universe has many more kinds of physical phenomena that emit gravitational waves and we'll need to complement them by interferometers in space, by timing signals from pulsars. These are both examples of variations on the theme of an interferometer, but with the larger baselines, separation of a million kilometers between parts of a, parts of a space interferometer network, or the galaxy scale distances that separate a set of pulsars, we should be able to push down in frequency tremendously. There's another complementary technique very well suited to the very, very interesting problem of seeing gravitational waves from the very early universe, cosmic microwave background polarization. It's been in the news a lot. I don't have time to explain it, but we surely hope it succeeds very soon. Let me close by saying that we are in the decade of gravitational wave detection. We expect from LIGO and our sister projects detections in the next few years, pulsar timing arrays may make detections of their signals on similar scales, and any day we could have good news from the cosmic background polarization studies. So we hope to contribute uh, to ongoing celebrations of anniversaries of Einstein's remarkable predictions uh, 100 years ago. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.